equals mc squared. The most recognized physics equation by the most recognized physicist of all time, Albert Einstein. His mass-energy equation turned our understanding of matter and energy upside down when he taught us that the energy in a particle was directly proportional to its mass. Not quite as well known, but equally as monumental as Planck's law, E equals HF, which launched one of the most successful theories of all time, quantum mechanics. It taught us that energy was a wave, and a wave's energy came in packets of energy proportional to its frequency. Two simple equations that paint two very different representations of matter and energy. So what if these two equations could be combined into one? What if they could be quantized so that matter and energy could be understood in terms of dimensionless integers that we could simply add and subtract? And using this completely new derivation, what if for the first time we could paint a picture of how energy really forms mass and motion? I hope it's worth a few minutes of your time to look into it. Join me and I'll show you Einstein's equation like you've never seen or understood it before. In order to build a mathematical model based on integers, we need to think of Planck's law in a new way. Planck's law states that the energy of a photon or a light particle is proportional to its frequency. Now for photons traveling through space, frequency and wavelength are related by the speed of light in a vacuum. Therefore, we can write Planck's law in terms of wavelength. We can quantize this equation with dimensionless integers by using the principle of harmonics. Let's start with a photon with a fundamental unit wavelength representing its lowest energy state. By dividing this unit wavelength by integer multiples of equal length, we create the harmonics of this fundamental frequency. According to Planck's law, the energy of a photon is proportional to the number of divisions in its unit wavelength. Therefore, we can now write the quantized version of Planck's law. In this equation, the fundamental unit wavelength must be a constant. It may be a real, undiscovered constant in nature, representing the smallest energy value a photon could possibly possess. For mathematical purposes, we can just set the unit wavelength to 1, and our classical and quantized equations will all equate. Another way to look at the unit wavelength from a practical sense is to think of it as the smallest possible division of energy. So long as it is less than the accuracy of our measurements, the quantized and classical equations will all yield the same results. Now let's update our picture model. It's much easier for us to think of energy in terms of particles rather than waves. One conceptual way to combine the two is to place one of our indivisible energy units at the start of each wavelength along the unit wavelength. We can dispense with the wave symbols altogether and just talk about a wave string with equally spaced beads or nodes of energy. Then to add up the total energy in our string, we simply count up the number of energy nodes. In creating this quantized Planck's Law equation, we have essentially quantized the quantum by creating the smallest unit of energy possible, whereby all measured energy values are simply an integer multiple of this tiniest bundle of allowed energy. This also has the effect of eliminating all those nasty singularities where our classical equations blow up when things approach zero. The fact that nature doesn't seem to blow up is further evidence that some minimal quanta likely does exist. Before we can extend our picture model, we need to go back and finish some math. It turns out that E equals mc squared is just one term in Einstein's energy equation. There's also a momentum term, where momentum equals velocity times mass. Einstein's equation is in the form of c squared equals a squared plus b squared, which we know to be Pythagorean's theorem equating the sides of a right triangle. Let's label the legs of this triangle as a, b, and c.
In order to integrate our quantized Planck's law equation into Einstein's energy momentum equation, we can simply break our energy string into two parts. We can apply some of our energy units to the formation of mass, denoted by Nm, and some of our energy units to the formation of momentum, denoted by Nv. Setting Einstein's rest mass term to the first term in this equation, we can calculate mass in terms of our new energy units. In mapping the energy integers to Einstein's right triangle relationship, we can see that the rest mass term, Nm, equals leg A, and the total energy count, leg C, or the hypotenuse of the triangle, is simply the sum of the energy units Nm plus Nv. Using Pythagorean's theorem, we can then calculate leg B, or the momentum portion of the energy triangle, to be the square root of Nv squared plus 2 times Nv times Nm. So what does this all mean? Let's return to our picture model for some answers. The key to how energy forms mass and motion is in the shape of the energy string. You see, a right triangle relationship doesn't just define Einstein's energy momentum equation, it also defines a helix. The length of each division along leg B defines the pitch of the helix, and the total number of leg B divisions governs its number of turns. The length of the helix in each 360 degree turn is known as de Broglie's wavelength. What's key here is there are two superimposed waves, the main energy wave, which can be thought of as a sinusoidal wave, and the de Broglie helical wave with its own independent helical shape and wavelength. Keep in mind, our helical energy string doesn't just sit there. It winds through space along the helical path at the speed of light. The helix itself translates through space at less than light speed because some of the motion is circular. For each 360 degree rotation, it translates in the axial direction by the pitch of the helix. Velocity of the helix is always a proportion of light speed, equal to the ratio of leg B over leg C, or the momentum portion of energy divided by the total energy. This confirms a principle of special relativity where matter and energy cannot travel faster than light speed. Now let's look at four cases that demonstrate how we can use our new quantized energy triangle to understand how energy forms matter in motion. We will use 13 energy units because the number 13 can form a Pythagorean triple where all sides of the right triangle are integers. So let's look at case number one where all 13 energy units are dedicated to mass or Nm equals 13 and Nv equals zero. In this case the energy string travels at light speed in a closed loop with no net translation. In case 2, let's dedicate 12 energy units to mass and one energy unit to motion. This changes the shape of our energy string from a closed loop to a helix that winds through space with a velocity of 5 thirteenths the speed of light. The 5 thirteenths ratio is leg B over leg C in our energy triangle. Leg A is the 12 units dedicated to mass. Leg C remains the total energy of 13. And by the Pythagorean theorem, we calculate leg B to be 5, which forms our Pythagorean triple. In case 3, we dedicate 5 energy units to mass and eight energy units to motion. Adding more energy to motion elongates our helix and our velocity increases to 12 thirteenths the speed of light. It's interesting to note that small increases in NV or the energy dedicated to motion has a much larger impact on leg B and the resulting velocity.
Finally, in case four, we dedicate all of our energy to motion and none to mass. This becomes our photon model. Our helix is now morphed into a straight line traveling at the speed of light. Our energy triangle has only one leg, leg B, with all 13 energy units being dedicated to it. This completes our model from a closed loop to a helix that elongates with added motion energy until it forms a straight line traveling at light speed. Both the picture model and the mathematical model works. So how does energy form mass or motion? It depends upon where on the helix we put our energy. If we add it to the circle or the circumference of the helix, we add mass. If we add our energy to the pitch or the axis of the helix, we add motion. It's all a matter of geometry. I really hope you've enjoyed this video and I provided you with a fresh look at Einstein's famous energy momentum equation. So which derivation is more fundamental, the classic or quantized version? It's hard to say. In many cases, like the Lorentz factor, the quantized version is actually simpler. But in the end, alternative derivations only really matter if they provide a fresh conceptual look at a time-tested established theory like special relativity. In this case, I hope I've accomplished that.